to another episode of Dialogues. My guest this week is David French, who is a preeminent public intellectual on the conservative side of American politics. He's a senior editor at The Dispatch and a columnist at, at Time magazine. And David's become very well known for his strong opposition to the presidency of, of Donald Trump and his consternation at the support of many Republicans for Donald Trump and not least uh, white evangelicals. And much of his work is to explain and understand that misalignment as he sees it between truly conservative principles and the rise of populism and authoritarianism. We talk a bit about how his experience of going to an actual war in Iraq influenced how he thought about the so-called culture war at home and the people we choose to think of as enemies domestically. We then turn to his, his big arguments about the need for pluralism in the American Republic, that we have to be a republic or nothing at all, and talk about the threats to pluralism from both the authoritarian right and from the left and how that's been playing out over recent years. And then we turn to his argument for the defenses against those anti-pluralist and authoritarian forces, not least the Bill of Rights and a strong judiciary. And he argues for federalism, for more devolution of power to states, which I'm less convinced will actually reduce the temperature of some of these culture war issues. We, we discussed that. My conversation with David made me realize how much liberal pluralists like me have come to rely on the courts now with politicians on both sides proposing or even passing laws that are anti-pluralist and unconstitutional and probably knowing that even as they they do it at that point laws become signals of whose side you're on rather than of actual policy intent and so the dangerous point we've got to is of an illiberal performative politics that's only held at bay by the judiciary the courts holding the line and maintaining our liberal republic, much to the frustration, depending on which day of the week it is, to the culture warriors on, on both sides, but to the enormous relief and eternal gratitude of, of all those of us who call ourselves liberals, that the judges are keeping the republic safe for now. But we can't ask the courts to keep doing that job forever. They can't remain in David's phrase, the only grown up in the room. And also we're seeing growing pressure to appoint more politically reliable judges in the future, rather than the constitution loving, liberty protecting, precedent respecting bunch that we have at the moment. In the long run, we need a grown up politics rather than the pantomime we've been subject to in recent years. The judiciary is the last line of defense for a liberal republic. As we've seen from many other countries, once that's overrun, then we're in real trouble. And it's holding firm for now, but I think it's right to ask how long it can do so, or more importantly, how long we should expect it to do so. Anyway, an unusual rant from me before diving in, but it's really made me reflect on just how much we're relying on the judiciary right now. And that came out of the conversation with David, which I, I hope you enjoy. David French, welcome to Dialogues. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm really excited for this uh, conversation. Um, and I hope we can cover your book um, on Divided We Fall, but also some of your recent writings on what's happening to American Christianity, what's happening to politics and so on. I think you're a, you're a preeminent public intellectual on the conservative side of, of all of these debates. And so I really want to dig into that. But just can you help situate yourself a little bit for for sure. those who don't know many many will know you and in in particular your own journey through litigator and then your own experience at war and perhaps even how the experience both of being let's say a legal culture warrior and then going to war and then coming back and how that's influenced how you see this current moment yeah um so i took a kind of unconventional path into journalism i um Graduated from law school all the way back in 94, which feels further and further <laughs> back <laughs> every day. Um, and then began, I, I first started as a as a commercial litigator, but even early in my career, I had a pro bono practice defending religious liberty um, and working on, per, for example, pro-life issues. And did that for a really long time. I became... After I left private, or after I left the commercial litigation world, I became president of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual mm -hmm. Rights in Education. And then in the middle of all of this, I um, also 
felt convicted that, you know, it's the height of the war on terror and the height of the Iraq war that I should serve my country. So I, I got an age waiver, <laughs> joined the reserves at, at uh, the ripe old age of um, 37 hmm. and went to officer basic course, um, was commissioned as a JAG officer, an army lawyer, deployed to Iraq in 07, 08. And so during all of this time, I'm, I am writing a little bit, but I'm mainly a, a lawyer and an activist um, and a litigator, very much involved in the culture wars, um, you know, uh, taking on university speech codes, for example. I was always a civil libertarian in that I, I defended the rights of right and left equally. You know, I was defending fundamental freedoms, but I also very much identified as a Republican. Uh, I was very partisan in my mindset, um, happy to defend the rights of folks on the left, but also no better way to put it than I was just a, I was a partisan Republican. And, and one way to sort of show how partisan I was, I had this in hindsight, pretty embarrassing interaction when right before I deployed to Iraq in 07, 08, as part of the surge. And uh, someone asked me, why, if I was doing all this, you know, good work for the Constitution here at home, why would I leave that and go to Iraq? And I said something along the lines of, well, I feel like the two greatest threats to the United States are jihadism abroad and sort of the far left at home, and I feel called to fight both. And, you know, I was at a conservative gathering and everybody cheered, you know, yay, <laughs> he gets it, you know. And so then I went and deployed, and, and I spent um, almost a year in Diyala province, Iraq, during the surge. And we were fighting al-Qaeda al in Iraq, but they were already sort of transitioning into this ISIS identity. They called themselves the Islamic Caliphate of Iraq. And I saw what an actual enemy looks like up close. And there's – I mean, I felt ashamed and embarrassed that I'd even said that sentence w before I left. And – that, you know, whatever disagreements I had with folks on the far left, my goodness, I, I lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts. My son was born in Ithaca, New York when I taught at Cornell Law School. I lived in Center City, Philadelphia. The first year of our marriage was in the middle of Manhattan. All of these places were quite blue, and yet I had a really good life in all of those places. And if I had tried to sort of like bring my family to <laughs> Al-Qaeda-held territory and in Iraq, I wouldn't have had a life. I mean, this mm. is, and so, you know, this idea that you see your fellow citizens as enemies, I, I, when I deployed to Iraq, I really was alienated from that view. And so I come home and I'm kind of detoxing from polarization and partisanship for, as a result of my experience in Iraq, just as I get home and I, and I feel like I'm joining a, rejoining a life and a nation and a culture that is growing more toxic in its polarization, mm. that while I'm sort of detoxing from partisanship, people are diving deeper into it. And where I'm sort of zigzagging away from seeing my political opponents as enemies, an awful lot of Americans were moving exactly in that direction. And so I began to increasingly feel like a fish out of water. You actually, I mean, you were going, actually, you were not only a fish out of, in some ways you were going completely against the tide. If you were... If you were personally depolarizing, then you came back to a, a country that was that was repolarizing. You, you write very well about this in some of the conference calls that you were invited right. to take part of to say that Obama was born in Kenya and, and so just the sense of how it had changed, uh, the country changed at the same time as you changed, but you were changing the other way. In fact, that clip that you're ashamed of now, of course, would be seen by many as brilliant politics you could use that right. clip as i mean if you if you, you could run for office off the back of that kind of of clip now because to say on the right to say we've got to fight the secular left we've got to fight the left is at, at home and i mean it's a terrific soundbite david yeah, you could have gone all the way <laughs> with that oh yeah people would be like he gets it he understands the stakes you know that uh, yeah, our nation does hang in the balance if, if the Democrats win. And in fact, that was, you know, one of the most powerful messages of the 2016 election was, you know, that Flight 93 essay that said, you know, charge the cockpit or you die. During 2020, I 
debated, you know, the prominent Trump Christian, Christian Trump supporter, Eric Metaxas Hmm. twice. And in both circumstances, he very clearly stated that America would be over if Joe Biden wins, that, that, you know, the American Republic would be in mortal jeopardy if Joe Biden wins. And so this idea that your political opponents don't just advance policies that you think are suboptimal or, you know, might be harmful in some concrete ways, but they will actually destroy the country (laughs) has become a kind of received conventional wisdom in parts of, and in big parts of the right and parts of the left as well. Yeah, that's where the language of war, it probably becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy to use that language, of course, but that sense of existential threat uh, seems yeah. real and growing on on both sides. And I, I want to dig in a little bit to the roots of that fear in just a moment. But another part of your biography that's interesting is that because you took this a, a strongly principled conservative position, and I think a, a pluralist position as opposed to a polarized position, you're a, you're a pluralist at heart, that put you at odds with the mainstream of the Republican Party, which is why you now say you have, you're have essentially Home, politically homeless, but it also, you paid a price. You write about the difficulty that you face in your family and the threats to your own family. You, you have a, a black daughter you, you adopted and the white supremacists were using her imagery and so on. And I was reading that and you're very modest about your involvement in Iraq. And I actually wondered whether you were more scared serving as an officer in Iraq or more scared at home facing some of these toxic threats well i mean there's no comparison to the environment we operated in when i was in iraq um that was you know we there was a point in time in march and april uh, of 2008 when our small unit of about 800 guys took and this was at at the peak of the surge about 140 150,000 american soldiers in country and my small unit took about 15% of the total casualties in Iraq for several multi-week spans. So we were in a terrible area uh, in Iraq. But, you know, what I would say about the threats we faced here, you know, I we actually had conversations. Do we need to move? You know, do we need to, you know, we knew people found our house. I mean, the um, you know, we, we have had, disturbing incident after disturbing incident after disturbing incident. And that's one of the things I write about in the book is that this sense of existential emergency had grown so great that if you disagreed with your own tribe, so to speak, you were viewed as a traitor. I mean, and, and you were viewed as somebody, um, you were viewed as somebody as a threat. And so, you know, people threatened my, family. They, they threatened my wife. Uh, they've threatened me. Um, her, cyber harassment, like you wouldn't believe. Um, just a, an unbelievable story of uh, a, attempted intimidation, uh, quite frankly. And this story, my story is not unique at all. It's not unique at all. I mean, just ask election officials during the 2020 election who got threatened by the right, just to ask any number of pundits slash journalists in 2016 who faced threats from the alt-right, um, an atmosphere of threat pervades part of the right if you try to d- dissent from the Trump position. If you defy Trump, um, in many ways, that atmosphere of threat often is more extreme directed to Republicans or former Republicans who disagree with Trump than it is against the left, which is— mm actually somewhat of a common thing in revolutionary movements that they'll go after the quote unquote in group moderate before they'll go after their opponent. Because part of this is about consolidating a political tribe as in welding them together as one mighty force. And so from that standpoint, internal dissent is an, is an incredible threat. And so, yeah, both everyone, you know, we have faced a we face some hard decisions about whether or not to move, how to protect our family in the last five years. And something I never thought I would face in my entire life as a citizen of this country, uh, just speaking what I believe to be true about politics and faith in this country. 
I mean, it's interesting. The certainly my experience in the UK was the the left was particularly good at that. The the cry of traitor and you know not sticking with the cause was something that in the UK anyway the left were particularly good at sort of slicing itself up and uh, any any deviation from orthodoxy. Whereas the right seemed to be much more pragmatic, much more Burkean, a bit broader. And and then Thatcher of course changed that a little bit, and she famously would ask, "Is he one of us?" And that was always the question, right? Is he one of us? And and so, but now it really feels like we have that sense of uh, treachery being being thrown around on on the right as well. So what I want to do, David, is is state what I believe to be your overarching argument, mm-hmm. and then break and then go through it. Uh, if I've got it right, first of all, and then we'll, we'll go through it. And I agree with I think the first three quarters of it, and I and I don't agree with the last. So. Let's see how we go. I think. All right. Here's what I think. I think that you're a you're a uh, you only you think that America only works as a plural nation. That's pretty yeah. clear from from your writing. Number two, that pluralism is currently under attack. Pretty sustained, serious attack from both the right and the left. That to restore slash maintain pluralism, there are two things we need to do. Number one is really stand firm in the legal defense of plurality and liberty first amendment style and then number two that's a legal bit and then the second thing we have to do is move towards federalism devolving of power to allow communities to more closely match the values of the people that comprise them and therefore right. take some of the heat is that is that a fair summary of of frenchism yeah that's a, i think that's a fair summary yeah absolutely all right well i say frenchism but of course actually in that famous essay that you also write about you actually it was against David Frenchism, and not many people get an ism. David, that's pretty. I mean, that, you're up with Marx and Keynes, Thatcher. I mean, an ism. It's not, like, it's not all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> well, especially it was, when it's a pejorative. Yeah. Yes, in that case, it, it absolutely was, and we'll we definitely want to turn to that. So, I think. The, I mean, in some ways, I think the first bit will be the least controversial, perhaps intellectually although i think politically very difficult which is you're a pluralist because you're an american and you say in your book america was built from the ground up to function as a pluralistic republic it can flourish only as Mm -hmm. a pluralistic republic you are very madisonian you quote madison on factions and so on and so for you america's plural or dead you're you're an american christian but in that order correct a Christian American in that order. Okay, but you don't think that <laughs> Christianity can can or should flourish in anything other than a plural society. You're not a theocrat and, in the way we're going to come on. Right, of course. Right. I mean, right. I mean, uh, so uh, absolutely not a theocrat. So I, here's I mean, why you'd, I even, you'd even be against the idea of an established religion. I mean, where I come from in the UK, we have you know the Church of England is an established church. You you wouldn't support the idea of an established church, even if it was your church, right. by some miracle, no, no. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't establish it as the church, would you? No, no. I think the combination of the free exercise clause and the establishment clause, which prevents establishment and protects free exercise, is free, uh, protects free exercise is one of the great historical developments for pluralism and for religious toleration that we've seen in world history. So, yeah, I would put it like this. I would say... In the United States of America, a, a in, diversity is a fact, and increasing diversity is a fact. Okay, so we are increasingly diverse on racial grounds. We are increasingly diverse on religious grounds. We are increasingly diverse on cultural grounds. And pluralism is the necessary response to that level of diversity, that our nation cannot work without pluralism, that a... A, uh, a a kind of governmental approach that is mimics one you see in much more homogenous, religiously homogenous or culturally homogenous countries just simply cannot work here. And even though we look back at the founding and we say, oh, well, look at a bunch of those white Christian landowning men who put got together and created a country— even by their own standards and the standards of the time, it was still a remarkably— pluralistic and diverse country. I mean, if you just look at the Eastern seaboard, 
the sort of the different religious strains of the Eastern Seaboard, they were a lot of the different religious strains of the wars of religion. <laughs> so even just those various Christian denominations hanging together as one country was something that could not be taken for granted in world history. And so um, America as an increasingly diverse country to which pluralism is a necessary response. Um, it's not an utopian response. It's not an idealistic response. It's a necessary response. And, and it's growing increasingly necessary, even as a number of American factions are growing increasingly impatient with pluralism. And that's causing some of our real problems. Yeah, I think that's right. I'm actually just reminded of a, of a, a story from the UK, which I think illustrates that it's very recently that some of these differences between Christian denominations look small to the outsider at the time. Yeah. I mean, you know, you read John Locke on, on Catholics, for example, and even in the UK, there was a British minister, a home office minister, and part of his role was to appoint uh, some bishops in the, to the Church of England. But then a civil servant came to him very embarrassed and said, I'm very sorry, minister, you can't do it. We'll have to get someone else to do it. And he said, why not? And they said, because you're a Roman Catholic. And so you can't appoint ministers into the Anglican Church. And he said, fine. But then he asked an interesting question. What if I was an outright atheist? And they said, oh, that would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so this, you know, and, you know, in theory, I think at least it was an issue for Tony Blair that he couldn't be prime minister if he was Catholic. So he didn't convert until after he left office. Uh, and so, you know, these, these differences may not seem big now, but they were sure as hell big then. And so I think that you can argue Huge. that it was pretty pretty plural. And let me, let me push you a little bit because you've made this instrumental argument for pluralism. It's necessary. Well, that means that in a, in a thought experiment, if you had the choice between living in a society that was less diverse and therefore could sustain a more, say, common Christian culture, that that would be normatively preferable. I would argue that pluralism is good in and of itself because it creates more creativity, you know, it creates more energy. The very fact of dissenting views makes us more innovative, that we learn from each other, we learn to respect difference and so on. And so I think that I would go a step further and argue that pluralism isn't just necessary. Pluralism's actually instrumentally, it's a good in and of itself. Would you go that far in your defense of pluralism? I would, I, I, well, you know, it depends on how we're going to define it sort of at the edges. I would say, for example, the rights in the Bill of Rights, which I think are indispensable to American plur or this pluralistic republic, are a pretty good statement of some pretty fundamental human rights. <laughs> and so, therefore, free exercise of religion, free speech, due process, the freedom of to be, you know, free of cruel and unusual punishment, freedom against self-incrimination, these are... I think these are statements and declarations of human rights that also are indispensable to pluralism. So, so there are aspects of the American Republic that I think are are not just sort of um, pragmatic instruments of pluralism, which I think so. For example, federalism is a more of a pragmatic instrument of pluralism that a much smaller and more homogenous country wouldn't necessarily have to be so federalist, for example. I mean, right. how federalist does Singapore have to be? Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. But, yeah. But if you're talking about sort of, there are aspects of the American Constitution that I think, and this is something that I circle my wagons around quite a bit, is the Bill of Rights and the book that, that you know, America at its worst, it has systematically denied marginalized populations the benefit of the Bill of Rights. As America has got, has gotten to be a better country, it has extended the blessings of liberty that are articulated in the, that Bill of Rights to more and more and more Americans. And so I think, yeah, regardless of the homogeneity of any given culture or nation, those rights in the Bill of Rights, I think, are, are um, mm -hmm. indispensable. Now, as far as some of the other manifestations of pluralism, sort of the decentralization, I'm, uh, one of my part of my emphasis on localism, for example, I think that's that's much more pragmatic and and circumstance dependent on things like size of nation, diversity of nation, etc. Sure, it's one of the reasons yeah, so why I get frustrated at at comparisons between oh well, this works in Sweden, so. 
you know, yeah. we should try this, you know, in the United States. Yeah, I, I have the same problem, particularly when you're looking at things. I, look, I work on intergenerational mobility a bit, and sometimes people right. will compare the US to Denmark and Sweden. And like, really, I mean, just to, even mm-hmm. as an empirical matter, I think that's very dubious. Okay, so so we're, we're pluralists. Uh, we believe in sh- sharing. You know, power will have to be shared in one way or in another. So it's about sharing power, not seizing power. But let's take the some of the attacks and i'm going to focus more on the attacks from the right simply because i think that's okay. that's where i think you have done most of, of your work not because i think there aren't attacks from the left and we can get to those too but but the attacks from the right from i'll call them i mean they're the inter- catholic integralists uh etc i'm just going to call them theocrats uh, so amari wrote the essay we we talked about and so on where right uh he and you quote him as saying that the goal you're a peacetime conservative david because you're in favor of pluralism you don't not only do you think the culture war can't be won you don't think it should be won because of what it would require you're i was thinking what the analogy is i think that you're more about the peace of westphalia allowing religious freedom than you are about the treaty of versailles dictating terms to a vanquished <laughs> enemy a, and i think that you know uh, sorab and uh, they're, they're they're more treaty of versailles people they're like okay we're gonna have to win and then we can dictate dictate time oh they so, go further their decks of the uss missouri unconditional surrender yep. sort of yeah yeah we're gonna have to that's that that's right we we, we need to win whereas we always establish that even if you could somehow turn the u.s into a christian theocracy even a soft one that you would not because what would be lost um uh, along along the the way and so obviously you've been engaging with that for some time now that that argument against the you know i, I will continue to use it i think theocrats is a fair fair term mm-hmm. is that they, they do want to impose various laws which would preference um christians where, where do you think that comes from well, you know, I think we have to sort of parse our religious communities in the U.S. So America has long had what uh, Ross Douthat has used this um, phrase, a soft Protestant establishment, which I think is a pretty good summary of sort of the the powers, the cultural and political power centers in the U.S. for a long, long, long time. Um, and so the way I phrased it is that white Protestants— because it's it's not been a soft Protestant establishment when it comes to the black church <laughs> by any stretch, right. but it's been a soft Protestant establishment when it comes to white Protestantism, that white Protestants have lost power and gained liberty and haven't liked the exchange. So mm-hmm. here, so when, let's say, let's go back, say about a hundred years or so. Um, the white Christian Protestant establishment was so powerful that it could enact a constitutional amendment to prohibit alcohol consumption. I mean, this this is not something that came from Catholicism, <laughs> you know. Definitely not. And hmm. it's it's it seems almost mind blowing that this country would enact a constitutional amendment to prohibit alcohol consumption. So look at this as an enormous sort of exercise in Christian power in this country. Now, the people would say, well, then that means we had a lot of religious liberty. No, this was also the time in which Blaine amendments were being put into state constitutions. And what were Blaine amendments? They were explicitly anti-Catholic state constitutional amendments that were designed to target, for example, Catholic education. Um, Also, at the same time, you know, we're talking the early 20th century, you wouldn't say that black Protestants enjoyed a great degree of liberty at all. So right. here you have an enormous amount of, of white Protestant power, but not a huge amount of religious liberty. And because I, I draw a big distinction between power and liberty. I mean, you feel free when you have power, right? But I feel like as if liber- liberty is more something you exercise to limit power. Um, and so what's happened since, and especially in the last 30, 40 years, is a uh especially in in the last two decades is really a pretty remarkable judicial revolution that has um a, a with few exceptions a really un, a, a really remarkable string of supreme court victories that have expanded concrete protections for religious liberty to an unprecedented state in in the united states um 
But at the same time, there's been a, see, a sense of cultural siege on the part of, in particular, white evangelicals. Yeah, that's, so they, that's um, right. So there's that's, less power, but there's more liberty, and a lot of people don't like to, don't like that exchange. Uh, that's that framing. I think runs through all your thought. It's very helpful to think about it in that way. In power versus liberty, and and actually, what Christians should want, <laughs> whether they should want power as opposed to liberty, is a good question. And and it's interesting also. I mean, the Protection of Religious Freedom Act was passed under Clinton, if I'm remembering correctly. And so, yes. <laughs> so this used to this. Uh, I mean, that's extraordinary from today's vantage point that you have a. Uh, the Democrat president signing a law to protect religious freedom, but in some ways that was the that was the starting point. I mean, so there was you're right. You had the you got the jurisprudence, but you've also got the legislation from the nineties. Yeah, the best the best president for religious liberty in modern times in the, in the last forty fifty years is Bill Clinton, and it's not close because he didn't he, he didn't just sign the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which was a sweeping federal law that restricts uh, federal statutes from infringing on religious liberty. He also passed the Religious Land Use, signed the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, which has been indispensable in case after case after case across the country in protecting sort of the ability of people to um, use their land for religious purposes. And it's protect small churches, it's protect Bible studies. I mean, it's just been a remarkable instrument of religious freedom. And that came out of the Clinton administration as well. Well, I mean, you think about my colleague, Bill Goldston, who served in the Clinton administration, has written about liberal pluralism and maximum, maximum feasible accommodation. And I think that the loss of that sense of commitment to pluralism on the left as well as on the right is clearly a big part of this story. But it's interesting the language you just used around siege and power and so on, because I think another strand of this attack on pluralism from, from the right, so I think we've, we've talked, if you like, about some of the intellectual attacks, but there is just, and this is where you've written a great deal, what's happening particularly to white evangelical Christians and the way they just swung so strongly behind Trump. And I know that's been something that you've personally engaged with. But but what Trump said in 2016 was Christianity is under tremendous siege. So that word that you just used, the idea of siege. And then he promised, if he becomes president, quotes, Christianity will have power. If I'm there, you're going to have plenty of power you don't need anybody else. And so right there, same speech, right, right there, you've got these twin ideas of you're under siege and I'm going to give you power. And it seems to me that the first of those is just basically wrong and the second of those is – the first of those is empirically wrong and the second is theologically wrong. It's just <laughs> not true. And the idea of having power – and then in 2020, Trump says on Biden he will, be, he will hurt God which is an extraordinary thing to think. And then I quote, there will be no oil. There will be, this is if Biden wins, there'll be no oil. There will be no guns. There will be no God. First of all, this, this puts a huge amount of power in Joe Biden's hand from a theological perspective. But, but Trump, as always, with that genius, he really just, I mean, he, he was tapping right into that bloodstream of like, you're under siege, you're under fire, you're under threat, Christianity's dying, there'll be no God. And and everyone's fallen for it, and it's just it's just dangerously wrong, isn't it? Well, you know, two two things are happening at one time, and I, I wrote a piece, and I called it um, "the cannon fire is real, but the walls are the walls are strong." So there are, in fact, efforts to undermine religious liberty. You see, you know, this is a, that's why we've had so many cases go up to the Supreme Court. There have been efforts to. Um, you know, for example, the Obama EEOC wanted to inject non-discrimination law into the pastor hiring and firing process. So that's a threat to religious freedom. The Supreme Court turned that back nine to zero. Yeah. So so what's happening is you do have these slings and arrows and cannonballs that are fired at the citadel of religious liberty. But the citadel of religious liberty isn't just repealing them, but that the way that precedent works is that Ironically enough, every cannonball builds the wall of the citadel higher. <laughs> assuming, <laughs> because, it, assuming that it bounces off, which so far it right. basically has, yeah. They have, yeah. And so uh, I'll give you a perfect example. And what inspired me to write that column is that a coalition of individuals sued 
the Department of Education saying that Title IX's religious exemption violates the Constitution. So Title IX, which prohibits sex discrimination in higher ed, has an exemption uh, that religious institutions can take advantage of. And so a coalition of people sued to try to get rid of that religious exemption. Well, every so one, yeah, those people are trying to restrict religious liberty. That There's no question about it. Here's number two. They're going to lose. <laughs> They're going to lose their case. And when they lose their case, a precedent will be set that ampli- reinforces religious liberty. So these things are happening at the same time. And so what ends up happening is that a politician will say, look what they're trying to do to you. And they'll sort of place them in the position of, and if it's not for me, they're going to succeed, which is not true. <laughs> Right. Because there is an enormous edifice of religious liberty case law that is not just 5-4, you know, GOP nominee, progressive, or not even 6-3 in the new court. Most of these cases are 7-2. The most recent, or 9-0. The most recent one was Catholic Social Services 1 at the Supreme Court, 9-0. 9-0. So to my all, all of them, just right. absolutely, yeah. So you can say, and this is one thing I'm I'm constantly writing is about is against the sense of alarmism because that sense of alarmism is very dangerous all by itself. Is that you can say that there is an effort to undermine religious liberty, but what you cannot say and should not say is that our religious liberty is one presidential election or two or three or four away from extinction. It's nowhere near that. And so what Trump did very well is sort of try to say to a public that doesn't know a whole lot about constitutional law, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm putting my body, it is my body that is between you and the left that wants to take away your liberty. And if you remove my body, if you remove me from the Oval Office, then you are helpless in front of the left. And and so that was the that was a fiction. That was just a pure fiction. And so, but an awful lot of people, again, you know, look, if you're a normal everyday American, what do you know about Filton versus city of Philadelphia? Exactly. And you just, you see what they are doing, what the other side are trying to do. And actually my, my, my quite deep fear is that politicians on both sides pursue causes, which at some level they probably know will fail when they right. reach court, but which send the right signal to their bases about whose side they're on. So they wield legislation effectively as a culture war weapon, knowing ultimately that it will fail. And maybe they wouldn't even wield it if they thought that it was going to uh, succeed. And so they almost, I can't quite get the the picture of it right, but it feels to me as almost like the politicians are just you know playing this game almost, with laws, and you see on both sides, DeSantis's law to fine social media companies Perfect that deplatform example. people, except un- unless they've got a theme park, which I know you've written about. So, have quotes Disney and and DeSantis is no fool; he knows that's not going to survive the courts. And so, why is he doing it? He, so, and the same on the same and critical race theory being banned. Even some of the things on the left, are they just they. Anybody who looks at the case law and these people, they know that they're not going to succeed in the end. Maybe even Trump's Muslim ban. Right. Just and so do you do you think that's how do you think laws are becoming playthings or, or like weapons rather? Oh, f- absolutely. I mean, well, you have, the, for example, on the left, you have California now imposing sanctions against 17 states yeah. um, where they're going to ban official travel. So this is a state imposing a sanction on another state because you don't like that other state's laws. The Cal- the DeSantis bill is a perfect example. And what this is like, it's uh, my, my colleague, General Goldberg, has a great phrase that he uses about our broken Congress. He calls it a parliament of pundits. Mm. And so because a lot of federal legislation is broken, it's not going any, you know, the the Congress is broken. A lot of most legislation isn't going anywhere. People create legislation at the federal level often as an opportunity to write an op-ed about it, to sort of show how serious they are about taking on big tech. Now at the state level, where you know a red state or a blue state has the ability to actually pass something, they often use an actual legislation. The legislation is the op-ed itself. <laughs> it's you know that that DeSantis social media bill is a perfect example. I mean, it is a 
it is nothing it is really nothing but a declaration that DeSantis stands against Twitter and Facebook on things like the Donald Trump deplatforming. Yeah, it's just leaning straight into cancel culture. I'm against cancel culture and here's a law to to prove it. I think that's exactly exactly right. And I think as I said, I think it's happening uh, somewhat on on both sides, but it does mean that this was actually one of the defenses I wanted to, that we're going to come to, which is the law, which is so far holding very well, as you just described in some of these cases in the nine zeros that we're seeing, etc. But but it does it does suggest that liberal pluralism has somewhat had to retreat to the judiciary. It's standing firm. You hope that this moment will pass, but I do worry that in the long run, even a pretty strong judiciary just can't carry. All the no. way. At some point, you need, we need people to just like get a bit more serious about about this. And you have this lovely description, actually, in your book about the power of Fox News and, and running to be a pundit and so on. And actually, Yuval Levin once said to me, he said, these people run for Congress because they want a gig on Fox News. And I laughed. And he looked at me and said, no, I'm not joking. No, Being of course. Deadly serious. And so you've got that that so i didn't know jonah's phrase but that's a perfect phrase for it but it, if that's what happens to our politics if politics becomes punditry it means we have retreated to the citadel of the judiciary and hope to god that they can last long enough right yeah i mean you know one one of the reasons why donald trump won the primary was he had so many primary opponents you know there was more than a dozen primary opponents and some of that to be honest is they had seen that some of the 2012, uh, the 2012 contestants had good, had developed some cable news careers because they had a moment in 2012. So in 2016, you know, it wasn't sort of a win or go home. It was sort of a win or go to Fox or go home. So there was a, there was a possibility of winning by losing. Mm. And so, you know, there was incentive for more people to get in and that split the vote more. And, you know, it was one of the reasons, one of many reasons why Trump was able to win. It wasn't, you know, one of the more significant, but it was a factor. And yeah, I mean, it, you cannot. And then what ends up happening is we put an awful lot on the court. And for right now, I mean, the Supreme Court seems to recognize the moment. It, it's very interesting to me how many of these really hot button issues are now being decided seven two eight one nine zero on pretty narrow grounds mm -hmm. and and what the court seems to be doing is it's walking it's it's be become the adult in the room but what you've seen on the right is a a change from look how brilliant trump's legal appointments were to we need better legal appointments next time because Trump nominated coming up through sort of this conservative legal movement system, a whole bunch of classical liberals. Yeah. You know, people who have He's a federalist, federalist society, fab, fabulous exactly. jurists. I mean, no one doubts their judicial ability at all, but they're all of that of that school. They're not cult. They're, they're, they weren't culture warriors. So you've written about the religious right. Well, I guess, what is it? Conservatives versus lawyers, basically. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so these people were, you know, those of us who knew about, say, a Brett Kavanaugh or a Justice Gorsuch or a Justice Barrett um, knew that, for example, they weren't going to strike down Obamacare. They weren't going to hear the election challenges. That just wasn't going to happen. But then what happens is the new right sees uh, a Justice Barrett swat aside challenges to Obamacare or swat aside election challenges and go and says, doesn't say, well, good for her. They say, well, we need different judges. <laughs> and so that's my concern over the long term is that if the right keeps moving in this much more authoritarian direction, then you're going to see a different breed of judicial nominee. And, and you see even splits within, say, the student branch of the Federalist Society now that they're are younger members of this sort of new right on the legal right who are much more focused on outcomes-based jurisprudence, and we need to just go ahead and win our cases, and 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 we need you know we need to use the the uh, judiciary as a blunt instrument of our political objectives, and that is a rising view on the new right on the young legal right, and 
that's what concerns me over a longer period, well, you know, long over run, a long term. I mean, the long run, that's a terrifying prospect because right. the, the the fault of the justices who've been appointed is that they're conservatives rather than populists or authoritarians. But you can also see the dynamic at play here it becomes a could become a vicious circle because if the political arena is no longer where these things are being decided, it's just a parliament of pundits and they're not really passing any meaningful legislation and it really is all being done in the courts then it makes perfect sense to shift the political battleground to getting the right nominees for the court but at that point it's pretty much close to game over it seems to me if you can't if the judiciary becomes as deeply politicized as some of the people you're talking about seem to want it to then then that's the last bastion right if you can't rely on the court then this game over for pluralism, probably. Well, and I mean, it's it's game over for the rule of law. I mean, you you attack the judiciary and and you turn the judiciary into essentially nothing but an adjunct of a political party, and you have real issues. And I know it's been very fashionable for people to say, "Well, that's that's what it's been for a long time." No, I mean, if you. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, the the different just, justices do have just different judicial philosophies, but there is a lot more consensus on sort of for, core fundamental uh, constitutional values than people who only pay casual attention understand. I mean, back when I was litigating first the First Amendment, you know, I was fortunate enough to prevail in cases in front of Carter appointees, Bush appointees, um Obama appointees, Clinton appointees, second Bush appointees, a lot of these core constitutional rights, there's an enormous amount of judicial consensus, as you see from a lot of the rulings in the current Supreme Court, is that these, it is not the case that you can just determine who's going to win a case by looking at who appointed the judge. Now, that might be a factor, that might be a factor but it is just simply not the case that that's a shorthand for who wins and who loses. I mean, that's just, and so, and it, it, it does a disservice to our republic when people try to pretend that that's the case. And the fact of the matter is there are folks on the new right who want it to be the case. The good news is the conservative legal movement is has strong antibodies against that point of view, it has very strong antibodies. Uh, yes. There are reasons why not one even Trump appointed justice or judge ruled for one of his election contests. It wasn't even close that they were going to rule for him. When you come to the left, a lot of you spend a lot of time and attacks from the left. We talked about some of the legal challenges from from the left, the left against pluralism, and you mentioned California. But actually, it's striking to me in your book. I think a bit less, perhaps, in more of your, some of your more recent writing. It's how often corporations feature as the bad guy, right. right? So it's Google firing Demore, it's it, boycotting states, it, it's et cetera. And, and it seems to me that exposes something of a tension in your position because corporations are private actors. They can they can do that if they want to, right? They're, they're, they're protected by the constitution. And so I don't know how you, how you think about that because it seems to me that a growing attack from the right is look at all these woke corporations, you know, Amazon taking books off and whatever, but they're perfectly entitled to do what they want. That's a very different kind of threat to the threat that might come from law or from political power. Uh, and so how do you square that circle of being a pluralist and a First Amendment guy and presumably defending the rights of private companies to to do as they wish within the law and someone who's worried about the culture war and that corporations are taking sides? Well, you can do two things at once. You can defend a liberty and disagree with the exercise of that liberty. You know, so this is something that people lose sight of all the time on Twitter. It's like, if I think it's absurd, for example, that a company would do business in China and boycott Georgia, <laughs> um, I can say, I think it's absurd that you're doing business in China and boycotting Georgia and you need to rethink that. And then at the same time say, Government, it's not your it's not your role to regulate corporate political expression. So one of the biggest problems I have with the right right now is that they'll look at a cultural issue. And you'll see this again and again, and this is more a manifest manifestation of the new right, is that they they don't deem that you're serious about addressing a cultural issue unless you're proposing a political solution. So 
you have a bunch of corporations in Silicon Va- Valley that are heavily, um, their workforces are heavily populated by people on the left. What are you going to do about it? So then you're going to propose some, this legal form that prevents them from speaking. No, mm-hmm. no. You know, the, the Bill of Rights is, again, to go back to, you know, one of the things I said earlier in the podcast, I think it's a it's a statement of some pretty fundamental human rights. And and overriding the Bill of Rights, because you don't like the political composition of a workforce, I think there's no justification for that. Uh, but at the same time, I can say to that workforce that I think has, because it's in its own cocoon and living in its own bubble, that you're making a big mistake. You shouldn't do this. And so we have this all or nothing thing that says, well, if I'm opposed to a woke corporate, so does quote unquote woke corporations actions, I should go all the way mm-hmm. into legislating. Nope. <laughs> no. I can say, Apple, don't boycott Georgia. You shouldn't boycott Georgia. And I don't have to then say, Washington, what are you going to do about Apple boycotting Georgia? And, yes. and yes. that gets lost in all of this. Whatever happened to persuasion? You know, whatever happened to making an argument rather than just appealing to raw power? Um, and, you know, it's funny because then what happens is a lot of people who can accurately perceive that there are cultural problems as a result of ideologically monolithic corporations or ac- academies then go to these legal solutions or political solutions that if you know anything about the underlying law, you're just like, what are you even talking about? Like one of my favorite is let's get rid of Section 230 and mandate that large social media companies – moderate according to the First Amendment, where if in its First Amendment protected activity, they must host it. Well, then that mushroom cloud you see is the explosion of porn on Facebook um, and on, you know, and on Instagram. I mean, so the, people don't think this through. <laughs> yeah, well, it's back to your point about, persu- I had Nick Clegg on as well, talking about some of the dilemmas that they have within, with the, he was talking about the Trump two-year ban, but it's interesting because, the again the frame of culture war is part of the problem but when we think about what changes cultures it's it's it's, there's a retreat from the idea that it's us that it's people engaging persuading arguing actually living differently perhaps by witness by example and and that actually so this idea of the question of how do cultures change has to too many people, this is, you've just really helped me see this, is to, on left and right has become by changing the law, effectively yeah. at the point of a gun, whereas actually that's not how cultures by and large change. They, they change over time as a result, and then the law follows that and so on. So culture change is a civic activity much more than it's a legal or political one, but people retreat straight away to here's a culture problem, where's the law to solve it? Right. And the new right then says, well, because the law is a teacher. Hmm. If the law is way outside of the bounds of the culture, the law doesn't teach us much. I mean, marijuana consumption Mm -hmm. for a long time was universally (laughs) against the law. Didn't teach many people it was wrong. I mean, you know, and you can go, you know, uh, for example, there, there have been laws against adultery or sodomy for example for many 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 years weren't teaching many people much at all i mean so when you're talking about culture uh and if the law is way ahead of the culture as opposed to reflecting culture then you know i think you've got some real problems and i'll I'll give you a perfect example um is the fact that silicon valley is overwhelmingly populated by people of the left is that a law problem or is that a culture problem? Hmm. Because um, one of the things, one of the popular proposals uh, to respond to sort of the ideological monoculture of Silicon Valley is, well, we need to make political affiliation a protected class like religion or sex or race. And then that'll, that'll teach them in Silicon Valley. Well, guess what state of the union where political affiliation is a protected class? California. Where is Silicon Valley? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. It is not the case that Google is populated by progressives because they're sitting there going through CVs and going, look at this evangelical conservative coder. He's out. 
look at this evangelical conservative marketer, she's out. That's not the reason why Google is progressive. It is not because of systemic employment. I want to turn last to your strong advocacy of federalism and and to argue against you, not on the substance of your argument for federalism, but as a solution to some of these cultural problems. You situate federalism and especially more power to states as a way to embrace pluralism and take some, take some of the heat out of the, quotes, culture war by allowing places to go their own way. And I, I, I see a, a sort of descriptive, I have a descriptive problem with it and a practical one. The descriptive one is, although you talk about states and you compare, for example, your home state of Tennessee to California, when I look at the political map, it feels much more to be a question of cities and other parts of states as much as it is within states. And that you, you by talking about Tennessee is different to California, of course, that's true. But Nashville and Memphis went for Biden two to one. Right? They, they went more strongly for Biden than California did as a, a whole state. And then you think about Charlotte, North Carolina, etc. And there are bits of California. Fresno was 50-50. And so I worry somewhat that your idea of devolving power to the state level misses the the real divide is less between state lines and more between urban clusters and rural clusters and so it won't help north carolina with after all you know over the bathroom law or tennessee over critical race theory to have more power to the states you'd need to go perhaps down another level if you even could do this so it sort of seems to me descriptively maybe to misstate where the lines are well i think for example so i i i I think, you know, there's a lot of validity in what you're saying, and I also am a big proponent of localism in the sense of pushing decisions to the most local, um, the most local level of government that's capable of resolving the issue. <laughs> yes, that's the subsidiarity now, principle spelled out. Right, right, clearly. exactly. Yeah. But there are some things that you still have to have state policy around. I mean. It would be very, very difficult to have to to let's take I have a whole chapter about California and single payer, for example. Yes, great. healthcare. There's only so much just based based because of resources um, and because of you know because of limited resources and complexity. There's only so much you can do to really have hyper local healthcare policies. For example, so rural counties, which have minimal resources, just minimal, couldn't be on their own for healthcare policy. They just couldn't. It's just not feasible in any way that would be just and in any way that would be decent to the the citizens of those communities. So there are certain policies that you you just have to have a degree of state control, taxation. You know, I live in a I live in a state where you do have variability in local tax rates. You have different county tax rates. But still, there it's a variation within a, a within a range, um, and so taxation is another one where you're going to have to have some state policies. I mean, and so there's environmental policies at the state level are much more. You sure. know, that's something for a, a broader state government. So there's a lot of things that you're just going to have to have a state um, policy that that you're that the 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 smallest relevant government that can deal with the issue is the state government itself. And so I think that there are quite a few issues where that of uh, the state government is um, the relevant government. And, and the fact of the matter is, it's really fascinating, because, in part because of the big sort, almost 80% of Americans now live in uh, what's called a trifecta jurisdiction, where one party controls the, house, the upper house, the lower house, and the governor's mansion. So in theory, really the vast majority of us are in communities where there would be, if there was a greater degree of federalism, uh, a high degree of variation in state policies and sort of a high degree of, of a sense that the political system can deliver to us a, uh, a set of political values and policies that not just a majority, but often a supermajority of citizens have agreement mm -hmm. ha agree with. I also state very clearly that there shouldn't be variation in the Bill of Rights. <laughs> sure. So you defend. So there's a sort of baseline defense of uh, First Amendment, uh, individual liberty, and so on. I think it's when you 
when we talk about those geographical areas as communities, I think that's when I struggle somewhat. Um, I mean, even, I mean, obviously, California is enormous, but Tennessee has a population of 7 million. That makes it bigger than Ireland, Denmark, New Zealand, Nicaragua, <laughs> etc. And so I mean, when you say Tennessee, right, the community of Tennessee isn't a sentence that I think runs that easily off the tongue. I think that there are communities within Tennessee. And so I agree. I think from a public policy point of view, I actually see no reason why you shouldn't let states do health care. And you talk about single payer in California because you know where people live. You've got decent information about who's in the system and who isn't. I think the other problem is it's very interesting to me that in your book, you talk about the issues that are tearing us apart and you have lesbian and gay rights as is one example, I guess more from the left and then guns uh, from the the right. Interestingly, then, when you talk about policy, you talk about things like health care. Um, and although people feel strongly about single payer health care, I don't think those are th- that's not a cultural issue that's tearing us apart. And issues, the issues where we do feel very strongly and deep with more quotes, cultural issues like guns, abortion, marriage, etc. They're just really hard to contain within a state. Right. They're just, they, they, don't, they don't very easily sit within state borders. I can construct, I can have different rules about health care, different rules about education, different rules about where, how old you have to be to drive. Those are all relatively enactable at state level. But if, I, if Tennessee bans abortion, people will just cross into North Carolina. If, if California bans guns, then people just bring them in from Missouri. And, and so I just, it, it feels to me at that point, it's quite hard to contain those issues. Well, yeah. I mean, I think so. F- f- let me back up a bit. Um, so, if you're talking about fundamental Bill of Rights issues, this is what the Bill of Rights does is essentially protects you from. If you have the power, you don't need the Bill of Rights. Right. If you run the place, you don't need the Bill of Rights because you you have all you need. What the Bill of Rights does is it says, if I don't have power, I still have these fundamental human rights protected, and so. When you threaten the Bill of Rights, you create a level of instability, I think, that well, a level of instability that um, has in the past proven to be nearly fatal to the United States of America. So, you know, what was slavery, but the total deprivation, the total deprivation of human rights? What was Jim Crow, but the near total deprivation? And so... What what is the argument that a um, a lot of that triggers a lot of culture war? It's that oh, you Christians, this is the fear mongering. You Christians are going to be second class citizens now. That when Joe Biden wins, he will have all of the power, and you will have none of the liberty. And so that's one of the reasons why I assert that it's vitally important to circle your wagons around the, around the Bill of Rights as a fundamental element of the social compact, because what it does, there's two things at once. One, if you have more localism on substantive policies that impact your life on a day-to-day basis, like healthcare, care, et cetera, you're going to de-escalate national politics on that level. And you're also going to defrustrate yourself a bit because mm. national politics has been helpless in many ways at dealing with large you know, a meaningful social problems. So you're going to de-escalate national politics. If you protect the Bill of Rights robustly, you're also going to de-escalate national politics and hostile local politics in an interesting way by preserving your fundamental rights, even if you're always losing elections, mm-hmm. which, you know, if you're, a, if you're a progressive in Tennessee, you're basically always losing elections. If you're a conservative in California, you're basically always losing elections. And so... You're going to be able to maintain that sort of fundamental element of citizenship. Now, it does not mean that we have no conflict. A pluralistic country is just, it's going to have conflict. But what a classical liberalism and pluralism does is it makes it manageable. So I think of it as the difference between unmanageable and manageable conflict. I like the way Scott Alexander, the pseudonymous writer of... Um, a blog that had the weird name Slate, Slate Star, Star Codex. Codex. Yes, yeah, he called uh, I believe it was liberalism, small l liberalism, the best civil war avoidance mechanism ever devised by the mind of man. Um, and you raised abortion. A lot of people who read my book have asked me about abortion. Uh, I'm going to quote back 1992 Ruth Bader Ginsburg. 
Okay, 1992, Ruth Bader Ginsburg mm-hmm. said in a New York University Law Review that if if, Ru, if, Roe v, if Roe v. Wade had been less breathtaking in scope, in other words, if it had not swept aside every state abortion regulation, she wondered out loud, would our nation be as fractured along abortion on the abortion question as it is today? And I think the answer to that is no, it would not. That it is the the real source of friction on the abortion issue from a standpoint of national unity has been the fact that it has been was decided by the court and eliminated from the democratic process. And so, uh, you know, I think if there was a reversal of Roe v. Wade, you would have a short term convulsive sense of what just happened here. But the restoration of abortion policy to the states, which quite frankly is where the constitutional system puts it, uh, I think over time would actually turn down the national temperature, not raise it. And do you just on that specific issue? So I, I hear you saying that many of the issues that I raised would fall under Bill of Rights issues. And so you mm-hmm. might worry that if you're worried that Tennessee is going to ban critical race theory teaching in its schools, don't worry because that will get the courts will deal with that. If you're worried that California is going to stop its officials trap or whatever the California equivalent is, you know, mandate critical race theory, then don't yeah, worry. Right. No, the Bill of Rights will will do it. So don't worry about that. But but abortion is an interesting one because if you have freedom of movement across state lines and you have different abortion policies in different states, when you just get a, a version of the, you know, the Ireland issue, obviously Ireland voted to legalize abortion, but before it did, there would just be, you know, young, young women crossing the Irish sea um, to get abortions in, in England or, or Wales. And I'm not saying that was the main factor behind the change, but I don't how there is still this issue about people can move. And so if you have sure. a particular policy in place, a place B doesn't, does that undermine in people, any way the, the argument? No, it's a well, feature, not a bug. I mean, people are moving right now. So what, what's ending up happening is we already have a, we already have a big sort. People are voting with their feet and moving to communities where they feel like they're around more like-minded. And right now it's creating a tension because you have Mm. huge like-minded communities that are frustrated in their ability to enact policies that are meaningful to their political values because of the centralization of power in Washington. And so you have sort of the big sort, which is a natural human – I mean, they're – you're never going to stop people in a free country from going to live in communities where they feel more comfortable living. That's just going to happen. Yeah. So how do you accommodate that? And I think you accommodate that with federalism. And how do you accommodate the reality that no matter how sort of uh, unicultural a place gets, that there will be dissenters, you accommodate that with the Bill of Rights, with a fundamental irreducible minimum of liberties. But when I, you know... We have a big sort already, and so what that big sort of al- is already doing it is creating these cocoons of people who are deeply frustrated with the political process, <laughs> deeply frustrated because they cannot. You know, look, I know Berkeley is a different kind of community policy wise than Franklin. It's not as if Franklin, Tennessee, where mm-hmm. I live, it's not as if we have no federalism. But you know, right now, for example, if if you feel like I want to live in a country that has a particular kind of health care uh, system or a particular kind of climate policy or a particular kind of fundamental tax structure, you know, I got to make sure that the senators from Mississippi are on my side. And, and what I'm saying is what we need is we need a situation where, to stick with the Tennessee-California dichotomy, where Nancy Pelosi is less important to my life and Marsha Blackburn is less important to their lives. And so I I think that if you're talking about a big sort and people voting with their feet, that's happening. I mean, like that is that is going on. That is a known phenomenon, but it's clustering us into these super frustrated Mm. ideological cocoons. And that creates an enormous amount of tension. Because you can't then act on it. You actually 
uh, collectively act on that shared set of values. You you actually, I think, correctly criticise the phrase. I hate this phrase of laboratories of democracy for states because right. because the, the idea behind that is we'll try it in a state and if it works we'll do it everywhere. Yeah, if we do. <laughs> right? The presumption is in the the metaphor, and there's also sometimes people will talk about like a zip code lottery um and again yeah. it's in the presumptions in the metaphor which, well how about a zip code democracy how about yes it's different in that zip code because there's a different politics there and they've elected they voted for different laws in that place and not a lottery any more than you could say there's a prosperity lottery around the world based on whether you live in you know bangladesh or the, it, that, that that's <laughs> it seems to me to misstate the problem so this yeah. is great yeah. David, thank you so much for your time. Um, I, I, knew, I knew that it would be a rich conversation, uh, and it, it, it certainly was. And thank you for your, your work. Uh, I think your independence uh, of mind and calling it as you see it um, is a, a very valued trait. And there are more and more people, I think, that we need to do that, but you'll, you'll certainly do it. And so I want to thank you not only for your time today, but for your, your work on behalf of, of the plural republic that we are both both in favor of. I'm a new member of it and I'm very <laughs> pleased, very pleased that it is a plural one. Absolutely. Well, what's the F Benjamin Franklin? It's a republic if you can keep it. If you can keep it's, it. It's a plural republic if you can keep it. Yes. And we all need to do we all need to do our bit. It won't keep itself. That's correct. That's correct. Thanks again, David. Thanks for listening to Dialogues. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate, and share the podcast in all the usual places. And send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests, to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time.